God. Today we're going to be reading one entire chapter out of the book of Revelation, which you can follow above or in your own Bible. If you do uh, need a bulletin for the taking of notes, make sure uh, that you grab one. Scotty's going to be offering them weekly, just in case people need them, because I know folks always end up running back to the table once we've started, so he will kind of check that out for us. Revelation 5, a continuation of John's glimpse of heaven, says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven who were on the earth or under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed, to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, myriads more than could be numbered, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Father, bless your word now. Encourage your people. Help us to grow in faith and help us to grow in wisdom and, and catch a little bit of a practical understanding that would motivate us in these last days of this church age. We love you, and we thank you, Father, that your word is alive, it is supernatural, and that faith does come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Bless now, we ask it in Christ's name, amen. You can be seated, folks. I would ask you today, to the best of your ability, and I know that you don't ever do anything deliberately to distract me, at least I hope not. Um, Try to hold your places unless you have an emergency, because it is always difficult, especially the older I get, to hold my attention when people are moving. It seems like when our attendances are lower, we move more. So make pretend there's a hundred in this room and you're scared to death that anyone would see you move. Amen? And uh, then maybe we'll hold forth. Also, you might leave and miss the very thing you need. Amen? 
So keep that in mind. Now don't be scared to death if you have a problem. I love you. Worthy is the Lamb. In chapter 4 and 5, we see that the Apostle John receives a glimpse of heaven. It starts in verse 4 of Revelation, the fourth chapter. You know he's been banished to the Isle of Patmos. You know that they tried to kill him, but God had a purpose for him to give us the revelation. We have to believe that there is a purpose for us receiving the book of Revelation. So many churches nowadays will not touch the book of Revelation because it's too complicated or it's too symbolic or there's too many metaphors and figuring out which is which is just beyond examination. And yet the first chapter says, blessed are they that read the prophecies of this book and hear them and do them. Christ said, why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say in Luke 6, 46. So how can we know what to do or what to expect or what to believe in unless we read the whole counsel of God? And uh, certainly I have my favorite topics in the Word of God. And when I get caught up even reading through the Bible through the year and I get into the genealogies, I am not a happy man but I know it's still the Word of God, and it's still inspired. So to the best of my ability, I pronounce all those names and try to move through it respectively or respectfully. And that's why we stand as we read His Word. So we believe probably between chapters 3 and 4, the rapture has occurred. The church is no longer mentioned. We're gone. We're in glory and we've seen a glimpse of heaven and the throne of God in chapter 4, but now John is going to more see the practical application. He's going to see what must take place. He's going to see more so the lamb lifted up as the lion with kingship emphasized as he gets ready to bring forth judgment on planet Earth against all ungodliness. Now remember, God always has a witness. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we learned several weeks ago about the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who first must be sealed, they must be protected on the planet before the judgments start to fall, which teaches us all over again that God does not judge the righteous with the wicked. They are protected even though they're in the midst of wickedness. We are protected even though we're in the midst of wickedness, the wickedness of this world. So they're going to get a chance to see, we're going to get a chance to see, the Lamb of God, the Savior, in action as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, once again, we move through life doing what human beings do. What do we do? Is everybody here a human being? I think so. You know, we center in on the temporal many times. We center in on what gets our attention, the things that sound the loudest, the loudest explosions that go off, we know all about that God is a still, small voice, and we should quiet our hearts and listen to him and ask for our faith to be increased with our wisdom. But let's be honest this morning. Many times we react first, and we get uptight and bothered before we really evaluate our Christian faith. We have to meditate more, I think. And I think a great illustration of meditation is revolving in our minds something over and over again till it makes its way down into our heart. And I think once it gets into our heart, it becomes extremely motivational. So even though we do what we do, we sometimes even go through the day without thinking about the Lord for a spell of time, understand that there are things going on, there is a reality that exists that we know nothing about, 
unless we read things like the book of Revelation. God desires that as things are in heaven, they would also be that way on earth. And it ought to be that way with believers to a certain extent. We're not in a perfect environment. We don't see the praise of God like we wish we would. But still there are things that go on up there that ought to go on down here, things that are beyond our comprehension. And we will notice as we look at the unveiling that's given by God. I think we need as believers to wake up. Revelation 13, 11, excuse me, Romans 13, 11, says, and that knowing the time, do we? <laughs> that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. So we're going to notice some things briefly. It is my desire to be practical. As I mentioned in the first week, going through 12 weeks of Revelation, I am not going to mention every little thing, especially the things where there are varied opinions, I want to give you the things we're sure of. I want to give you the things that will help us to live our life bringing glory to the Son of God. So first off this morning, we see the setting, a magnificent throne, and a mysterious scroll. Now, I know you don't carry scrolls around. I realize that. And there's a lot of terminology in the Word of God we don't necessarily understand. Verses 1 through 3, again, a little bit redundant, but how often do you read the book of Revelation? So I think we can mention it a couple of times over and over again. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed, with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Pretty amazing. Or even to look at it, they couldn't look at it. Now, we believe, we've looked at verses in weeks gone by, that this scroll is the title deed of planet Earth. Ownership. Whoever owns this deed owns this world, and unfortunately, it was forfeited by mankind by the first Adam. When sin entered this world, that's why we waited for the second Adam to come along, Jesus, and make things right. Now, when I look at various books, I used to get books and never read them, but I thought they looked good on the shelf, you know, and maybe people would think a little bit more of me. I would put plaques behind my desk on the wall. I don't think it made a bit of difference, you know, with anybody. That's why they're not behind me anymore. You know, but, you know, a book has either a cardboard or a leather binding and usually is designated by chapters and verses and things like that. But that's not the scroll that we're reading about here in the early parts of chapter 5. Uh, this is how they did things in Bible days. They would take a big scroll or papyrus and they would start writing. And after they wrote and felt like they had finished a complete thought, they would roll it up to cover the writing, and they would take some hot wax, and they would drip wax or seal that first section of the papyrus, of the scroll, the roll, they'd seal it with wax. Sometimes if the person writing these words had some authority, he would have a signet ring, and he would come down with his ring in that wax, showing the authority behind the one who had written that scroll. Well, that's the way this scroll was. This title deed to planet Earth, it went away, the, the uh, wax was applied, and then more was written. The wax was applied, it was rolled up, and then more was written, and there were seven seals, seven chapters, in this scroll 
of things that would need to take place to bring the title deed, the ownership of planet Earth, back to Almighty God. At this present time, if you haven't noticed, the God of this world, small g, Satan, is in control. Please understand, he still has to get his marching orders from God. He still has to ask permission to do a variety of things, especially to do something to you. He needs to ask permission. But God is the master multitasker that he can take even evil bad things and cause it to come out good for us as he develops us. That's why we pray for wisdom. That's why we don't curse every lousy thing that comes into our life because we're trusting God to work all things together for good. Right? That's the way that we want to be. So this is the mysterious scroll that has seven seals, and we find the God of this world is in charge of things, and I think you've noticed that. Look at our world. Look at our government. Look at one war after another. We've always been at war in one capacity or another. Heartache, mental illness, leadership in general. We have a number of verses that talk about the God, small g, of this world. One of the ones that stirs my heart the most is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So as always, the issue is Jesus. And the God of this world really doesn't care what version of the Bible you use. He really doesn't care if you have a tie on today or a dress on today or what kind of songs you like. I know you think that's major stuff, the issue is Jesus. He's very concerned about where you stand with the Son of God. He doesn't want you to know who he is. He doesn't want you to know what he's accomplished or where he's been victorious. He just wants you to be religious. And that's fine with Satan. In fact, if you deny the existence of Satan, he doesn't care. He likes that just fine. But as believers, we ought to be on the cutting edge to understand what the Bible teaches in these things. In this scroll with the seven seals, we are going to see three series of seven judgments. We're going to see the seals, we're going to see, and again, it's not the, oh, 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 you know, uh, that's not what we're talking about. Years ago, I stood up in a church that I had started, my only church I started on Cape Cod, and I read, I don't know if it was Hebrews or James, I said to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, and a woman came up to me afterwards, she wanted to know what Indians they were, you know, because being on the Cape, we had Wampanoag, so she wanted to know what I meant by that. She had no clue concerning the tribes of Israel, and we have to realize that's the world we live in. People do not understand these things per se, so we have to understand what is going on here. The seals, the trumpets, and then the bowls, and the old KJV says vials, because these vials or bowls will pour out judgment upon the earth. So three series of seven judgments. Those on earth won't you know, see this big bowl coming down. It'll all be orchestrated by God as he judges sin and still tries to reach people who are living on planet Earth. Well, we see a strong angel has a question and a challenge. He says, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break the seals? to regain the title ownership of planet Earth. Who's worthy to do that? Well, I remember years ago, 
on Cape Cod when we had started Faith Baptist Church, started out in Hyannis, and then we eventually grew and went to different locations. We ended up in Osterville. And we purchased property there. We had a 15,000 foot square building on the back of the property and a house on the front. It was like set up for a church. And we went through a number of obstacles, had to jump through a number of hoops to see this property come to fruition, that we would own it as our own church. And I remember we thought that we had been victorious in all things. And then suddenly, through the back door, we found out that there was what was called a clouded title. And I was like, you know, I made like I knew what they were talking about, but I didn't. Oh, yes, a clouded title. Is that bad? Oh, yeah, you cannot purchase this property if the title is clouded. I found out there was an old woman who was related to the present owner, and somehow they needed her signature in order for us to be able to buy the property. And it was a snag for several weeks as they tried to get her to sign, but she was not able to sign. She wasn't thinking clearly. And eventually, by God's grace and miracles, we got to close even though she actually never signed off. But I know what it is to have a clouded title, not to be the owner, not to be entitled, not to be able to use the property for what you believe God was giving it to you for. And I know what a frustration it was in heaven for a spell when they said, who is worthy to open up this scroll and break these seals and have ownership? be returned to God because man had forfeited it. Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Look at verse 3 of Revelation 5. It says, And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look on it. So no one was worthy to remedy this situation. But can't we kind of look at that and relate in some other areas? How about salvation? That only comes through Jesus. Is the world trying to come to God by another way? By another means? By things that will never sacrifice? Or never, never cause satisfaction? Why are there verses in the Bible like John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Why are there verses like Acts 4, 12? Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Why was it, was it that the woman with the issue of blood, who bled for 12 years, tried everything? She went to the physicians, you know, the doctors of their day. They couldn't help her. Only Jesus could help her when he, she touched the hem of his garment. What about Legion, the demonic, who dwelt among the tombs, naked, screaming, cutting himself? It said the town had tried to fix him. You know what their remedy was, finally? <laughs> I work as a chaplain in a mental institution. They restrained him. They put chains on him. That's the best we can do. Sometimes, and he broke the chains. But when he met up with Jesus, he ended up clothed and in his right mind. And when you came to Christ, you ended up in your right mind. We might have thought that we were on the cutting edge, but we were zombies. You ever see those movies, those dumb zombies that just bump into stuff? You know, they don't look that dangerous to me. It's kind of funny. But if they catch you, you're in trouble because they'll eat you. You know, and they're just in a big pack wandering around moaning, bumping into things. That's kind of how we were, spiritually speaking. We didn't understand what was going on. We didn't say, why am I here? Why was I created? What's my purpose in life? And once you started asking that, Hey, listen, when you're seeking after God, he will make himself known to you. 
He will bring someone into your world to help you with that. I think as believers, we have to come to the conclusion that anything outside of God, it doesn't satisfy. It's not long-lasting. It will not fix what ails you long-term. And I think if we would get that in the fiber of our being, our hearts would break more for people. I want you to turn for a moment with me to Isaiah, the 55th chapter. I think this goes along with what we're saying. There are not many ways. Christianity is exclusive. People do need Jesus. People do need to embrace God's plan. Isaiah 55, if you have your Bible, it's not on the PowerPoint. Isaiah 55 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, verse 1, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. And we'll stop right there. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Only God can bring things that are eternal and worthwhile in our life. Didn't Jesus say, for without me, you can do nothing? Amen. Nothing significant, nothing eternal, nothing worthwhile. Secondly, this morning, Jesus, this is incredible, the lion who is the lamb. So we see one glorified being who is not only the lamb, but he is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, 4 to 7 John's weeping because no one is worthy to open up the scroll. He says, so I wept much, because no one was worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns denoting power and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, God the Father, because he was Jesus, the victorious Lord, the one who had died for sin, the one who was dead but now is alive forevermore, as described in Revelation, the first chapter. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher of our Faith. The lamb bears the marks of a lamb slain, a lamb sacrificed, yet he's alive. I don't know what that'll be like throughout eternity, looking over and seeing the lamb who is also the lion of the tribe of Judah, and him appearing to be freshly slain, to remind us for all eternity of the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. When people walk up to us and they say, why are you here? Not that anyone will. You won't say, I was a Sunday school teacher. You won't say, I really sang out in the worship time. You won't say, I was kind to people. There's only one way. And it's by way of the cross, by what Jesus Christ accomplished. If they did ask, you would simply point and say, look at the Lamb. That's why I'm here. 
my sin has been taken care of. So the Lamb, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, you know how humble he was. Read Philippians, the second chapter, the humility. If I were to give you some Greek, the kenosis theory, but we don't do that that often, right? Humility. He came in the humblest of ways. But Revelation 19 teaches us when he returns with his saints and the angelic force, we will see the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he will be designated as the king of kings. And the Lord of lords, as he comes to battle at the battle of Armageddon, which is a whole other sermon, uh, out in the future. So he is dead, appearing to be slain, yet alive. What did he conquer? Sin. I'm going to try to be very good. I'm never going to do that again. And then you do it a hundred more times. Even as a believer, don't you do some of the same stuff over and over again? Thank God your forgiveness is not based on you holding back and having self-control. It's based on the blood of Jesus Christ. So he conquered sin, the grave, and the works of Satan. Look with me quickly at Revelation 12 and verse 11. One day, which will be a whole other message, <laughs> one day there will be war in heaven for just a brief amount of time. Revelation 12 and verse 11. Understand God is high and above all of this. This is the angels battling. It says in verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Understand this is a place where Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is going to be cast out of heaven. He's not going to come before the throne of God anymore to point out your sin but he's going to be cast out of heaven and he will be overcome by the blood of the Lamb, which is pretty exciting. Isaiah 53 in verse 7, most of you are familiar with the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He came to die. That was the plan. And he loved us till the end. He could have come down from the cross. He could have called legions of angels. He could have ended the whole thing. Were we deserving? Were we lovable? Not at all. But he loved us. We don't understand that, but thank God for it. He loved us, and he loved us till the very end. And finally, if you'll turn right before Revelation, I'm giving you a meal today, not a snack. Alan always likes a meal. He doesn't want a snack. All right, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You know, if, the, if you love the Word of God and if it helps you, it's great reading the Scriptures together collectively in God's house. First. Peter 1 and verses 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Is it any wonder that Paul got stirred up at Mars Hill as he looked at what people were trusting in? Dumb, dead, lifeless idols? And Paul had embraced the Son of God? Paul had been knocked off of his donkey or his horse and heard, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And I'll real quick mention again, 
That was a farming tool, that goad. It was about 8 to 12 feet long. It had a sharp stone or a piece of metal on the end. And when the oxen weren't doing right, that farmer would flick them. And they'd kick. But he was 12 feet back. They couldn't get to him. So Jesus used that example to Saul. Hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? Hard for you to get at me. Hard for you to accomplish your own will. Folks, aren't we learning? Haven't we learned to do it God's way? And that is when we will truly be successful. The third and final thing this morning, Jesus is the Lord of all nations. And let me throw in, whether you want him to be or not. And I don't believe that. That's okay. It's still true. And one day, all of these things are going to take place. But I would rather you be on the winning side, because I love you, right? Revelation 5, 8 to 13. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You were worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power, riches, and wisdom, strength and honor, glory and blessing, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Psalm 107, we're not going to look there right now, verses 2 to 7 says, God has gathered us from a number of different places, from the north, from the south, from the east to the west. Even this small group here this morning, you've come from different geographical locations to God. Not even in attendance of this church today, just coming to God. You came from different places, but understand that goes on globally where God draws people from the north and the south and the east and the west. And thank God that he does that. Verse 8, our part in the master plan. Verse 8 talks about the prayers of the saints, those golden bowls full of incense. Do you know why we're pushing prayer? We have a prayer chain. We have a prayer challenge. We want Colonial to be a house of prayer. Well, what will happen? God will bless us. It might not be by numbers, but I pray so because he doesn't want anybody to perish. But we're told to pray. We're told it matters. We're told God keeps track of our prayers. We're told even when we weep for people, God keeps our tears in his bottle. He's mindful of when we pray and when we weep. Read Psalm 126 sometime about praying and weeping and scattering precious seed. And you'll see the impact of that. Philippians 2, if you want to write it down, verses 10 and 11, says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 9, Jesus is told, the Lamb is told, he's worthy. He's prevailed to take the scroll, the title deed, of planet Earth because he was slain. He offered sacrifice for the redemption of everyone. He is the superstar of heaven. 
There is none like him. You can amen at any moment. It's okay. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen? We will be praising him for all eternity. What did Jesus say when the Pharisees, when the palms were spread and waved and they said, quiet down your disciples, they're, they're bordering on worship here. Jesus said, if you silence them, the rocks will cry out. We ought to give God praise. We're so afraid of becoming charismatic, we don't say anything. You know, we don't even know how to clap. I watch people and they miss. Yeah. We ought to get excited about the things of Almighty God because He has prevailed to open the scroll, to break the seals, to return things to the place where they're supposed to be. And that's what's happening even now, whether we know it or not. Don't get concerned over the tragedies in the world. The God of this world, small G's, doing his thing. But God will bring people to himself through that stuff. He will glorify himself. Verse 10, Revelation 5, it tells us we shall reign on the earth. Could we really reign on the earth right now? You think the government would allow us to? <laughs> Do you think the present conditions would dictate that that's an okay thing? No, we can't even pray in the schools anymore. Remember when that was all taken away? The Ten Commandments have been ripped down. Professional sports figures don't want to kneel. Don't want to cross their heart as we lift up our country that was founded on Christian principles. The world is not ready for us to do anything until Jesus takes this scroll, opens it up, breaks the seals because he has prevailed. And we will see all of this come to fruition. Today, everything of God is trodden underfoot but he will make all things right. Don't worry. Remember that song? Don't worry, be happy. Was that the order it came in? I can't remember. I used to like that guy. It used to calm me down. It was like a Lamaze class. You know, don't worry, be happy. Remember that? No? You're not as old as me? All right. <laughs> in conclusion, we conclude, and rightfully so, verse 14, with worship. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. I think we ought to review Revelation 4 and 5 every now and then. And here's the reasons why. I wrote some things down. I think we'd be less prone to complaint if we knew the end of the story and really believed what God's going to do. I think we'd be less likely to give up. I think we'd be less likely to dabble in worldly things if we saw what God was doing. I think we would give Jesus his rightful place in our life and in our hearts and not think that Jesus is just one of many things. I think that we would be about enhancing the kingdom of God to tell as many people as possible to concentrate on the eternal, not the temporal, and to cause us to engage with our eyes on eternity. As slain missionary martyr William Elliot, missionary to Ecuador, stated, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment, friends. Thank you for listening so well, and especially now at the invitation as we make decisions for the Lord. Jesus has prevailed, which means you also prevail, if you are found in him. One day when you stand before God, 
I'll probably say a little bit about this at the mission today. God will not say, how big was your house again? How expensive was your car? What was your square footage of the business you took over and the facilities there? How pretty was your wife? How handsome was your husband? How many kids did you have? The only thing that will matter is if Jesus is your Lord and Savior and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is how you will prevail. That's how you're prevailing right now. Even though life is tough, it's overwhelming sometimes. But sit still for a moment and remember, Jesus has prevailed. He has saved you to the uttermost, Hebrews 7.25. He wants to touch every area of your life with his salvation. Maybe right now, God has brought some things to mind that are encouraging you, helping you, giving you a plan of action. And by an uplifted hand, you'd say, hey, Pastor Gary, he's speaking to my heart. Pray for me this morning. Anybody like that today? Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Hands all over. Anybody else? God speaking to your heart. Maybe God's calming you down, saying, I'm in control. It's all going according to plan. And I'd encourage you, even though I have listened to most of your testimonies, if you do not believe you're in Christ, that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that is the most important thing to consider. Do you have a home in heaven? Have you been born again? Have you been born from above? And that would be your first item of business, to call me up and say, we need to talk. If you're not sure, you're going to heaven. Nothing else matters if you're not sure of that. Father, we thank you that we could be here today. We thank you, Lord, that you have purchased every believer with your blood. You have prevailed. You are the only one that is worthy to open up the scroll and break those seals. And Father, as believers, help us, even if we're still confused, to wrap our hearts around that, to understand that you do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Thank you for the sinless perfection of Jesus. Thank you for the perfect redemptive work of the Lamb. Thank you that this Lamb is also a lion who will prevail and we will rule and reign with him one day on this earth. Thank you for that. We don't understand it all, but we reach out by faith and embrace it. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.